making a life worth living and retirement worth having is really about having enough people in our lives to help in times of struggle, to help in times of success, and literally to enjoy our life to the fullest. When people meet in an impromptu way, you never know what can come about from those conversations. I literally met a couple people today just through humble networking. That's what people in the professional services businesses do. We are salesmen, we are marketers, we are professionals of sorts, and we literally have to reach out and meet someone new every single day. There's sort of this idea that if I use enough technology, my little brand, my little company is going to take off because people will just flock to whatever I produce in content. That is actually not true. What really makes people listen to our content is the relationship we either had with them or the relationship we're producing right now or the relationship we hope to produce going forward based on the content literally that we're sharing. And in life, we have to do those things. There's always somebody who thinks they've got some idea about who a person is just by looking at them, just by sizing them up, just by doing one or two things, but that's not always the case. In truth, we have people who do lots of things to produce information about other people. It's called social engineering. And a lot of companies are making the news right now, particularly NPR, talking about how companies are gathering information, even if they don't have a plan yet for how to use that information. And that's sort of a professional interesting point, that companies are literally taking and are viewing data from the various search engines that we utilize, or the Facebook pages, or other aspects of our social media controls that really are not within our control. You see, social media is owned by those social media companies, so they can literally take our data off or online if they wish. One of the social media hits to my life was someone deleted every single photo I had on Twitter. Now, was that the president of the company telling some underling to delete his photos because I reached out and said, look, this is getting a little unusual that I'm tweeting things and I'm not getting through to people. Or was it some underling who just thought they'll do that? Or was it some family member who illegally and illicitly got onto my profiles through a family member's computer that I was allowed to borrow for that point of my life? You see, people do all sorts of malicious things thinking they have the power to ruin a life or they have the power to support a life. But the real question in this world is what kind of person are you? Are you a person that goes out to try to really network lovingly to produce strategic partnerships, profitable partnerships, or just good old-fashioned friendly alliances that make sure that you have enough productivity in your professional realm? Now, in our professional realms, we have to produce an income. That income generates a revenue for a company, and from that revenue, we gain a salary. That's usually how it works, unless we're the business owner. If we're the practical business owner, then we have to really look at what makes money, how many hours does it really take to produce that amount of income, and are we getting enough return on our investment of time? You see, there's lots of ways to make money. I often talk about this in my old videos about how you can make a million dollars based on the number of sales you have, based on the cost of those sales, and literally how many of those add up to make a million dollars. But only some of the Hollywood elite get to how to do that because they put their bodies, their hearts, their minds, their souls in front of millions of people who love them, hate them, or just voyeur in on their lives. And from that, they get results in sales for the companies in which they're promoting or advertising for their own name brand. That is, in essence, what we all do. We just aren't doing it at that high level, most of us. The people who make the fame in the world openly get the branding opportunities. It's sort of like when Tiger Woods lost some of his funding and his sponsorships because of that little liaison he had a long time ago. We don't really know whether or not that was a truthful situation. He might have admitted on television. I practically don't remember. I just remember that he lost some important relationships in the business part of his life. And that sort of took a hit on his integrity and his family name and other things. You see, when we do things like this, people sometimes intentionally go after someone. They go out there to try and ruin them, to pretend to be them, to do social engineering, to act like they're a person that person's trying to talk to. And maybe some of these larger companies are actually doing that. Maybe they're paying their little geeky engineers to sit in, lawyer in on people's conversations, and then pretend that we're actually getting through. Because the reality is, when it comes to internet technology, we have no way to process whether or not our text messages are truly getting through to the person in which we're longing to speak to. Now, I've often been a long proponent of video. I definitely feel that video is something that we should be doing more of so that people, when they look for us online, can go, that's the guy I met by photograph, but this is actually his voice. And we can actually have a voice imprint of the person in which we're listening to. Now, 
the good, the bad, and the ugly of that is that a person who's got socially inept skills, who likes to harm other people, might literally take some of our words in a file that they secretly record of us based possibly on the laws of their state that might allow them to only notify one party. And most people who are doing this integrity-wise give people the option to opt out of being recorded. But the reality is, regardless of the law, someone could edit that stuff together and slew a whole letter of explicit explicatives in line as if the person actually said it. Now, maybe they just were passionate about a pro project or a topic. I literally listened to two men talk at a Panera, not intentionally, just the man was talking so loud, there was no way to have any social space from their conversation. But this young 30-year-old literally was using the word friggin' every five minutes. I want to walk over and say, did your father not teach you how to sell professionally? But I didn't because I'm clearly 15 years his senior and I openly just was enjoying listening to the bullshit of the exchange. Now I just said a bad word possibly and if there's a 12 year old listening then I'm in trouble because my students are literally the ages of my language school between roughly eight or nine years old which is when we sort of thought they could kind of focus enough to do it. 10 is really a better age to start languages but openly and up to I think our oldest student was in their 70s but she didn't stay around long because the mind is different at 70 than it is at 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. But openly, if you're an educator, you recognize that. This is not the case for everyone. There are people like my mom who literally avidly read just to keep her mind as sharp as she can, to keep abreast of conditions going on, but she's also highly malleable and highly influenced by the siblings of my life. That's a real problem for me at most times. And openly, I can tell when they're lying. When they're lying, I get annoyed. But what am I supposed to do? They are blood relatives. They are not directly my family. They're not in any openly legal way to me, but they've done a lot of monkeying around in my legal life. And there's a lot of proof to that. Now, openly, why do I share the story? Because everybody has a family. Everybody has to create a new family. And we either have the birth family we grew up with or the family that we choose to create in our life that makes us happy, that provides us joy, that gives us good times, that gives us love that protects our souls and life and then openly is something that we can possibly share with the world. Pardon me. Now, there's a lot of things in my podcast that are authentic. That little gap in Japanese was not intentional, but I did just literally have lunch at a place where I like to go to do a little work because it's for the most part quiet and for the most part I'm left alone. Now, in life we have moments of time to make a difference for other people. So how do we make a difference for other people? We literally either talk to them while they're having a dinner for a networking event, or we literally produce a training period where we can actually talk to what I like to call selling one to the many, meaning we are the one person in front of a group of 10 to 20 people, maybe larger if we're fortunate enough to book something like that, but openly within that group, possibly 30% of that group will be interested in what we're selling. When we play the Russian roulette game of online, what we don't really know is how much of our technology that we're purchasing is actually literally getting through. This has been a long time question I've had in dealing with social media. As more and more people got on social media, the costs and requirements of the social media enterprises that practically provide a lot of the free services that we're not paying for might not be giving us the same level of free service they once were because now they have paid versions of LinkedIn and paid versions of Twitter and paid versions of Facebook. And let's face it, in life it's nice to get things for free, but it's also nice to know how much free we're going to get so we know at what point it's time to pay for the next level. And that's somewhat the difference between the traditional technology companies like GoDaddy and others that are really clear. Hey, for this package price, you're going to get this stuff right here. And openly, that's the law, that legally they're bound to provide us that, in, that opportunity. If someone in technology decides not to do that, where is the legal line? Who is the watchdog of those things? Now, I'm not picking anybody in particular. I have used that, that service for more than 10 years of my life. And openly, I like their control panels. I like how easy it is to use their stuff. And I usually tell people and recommend people that they should go for that program. But openly, there's also the other side of that coin. That since I have participated with that program in a strategic alliance, albeit incredibly modest compared to some of their other uh, possible clients that they support in the world who have much larger audiences, I literally feel 
that the length of time someone has been a loyal customer should matter to the customer service agents and the salespeople who are taking our new deals for the new year. You see, one mistake they made is they make in a lot of companies is they try to give the new clients the best deals. That's not the way it works in service programs. In my program, everybody got the same price year after year after year. I almost never changed prices in my service business because I was content at the rate in which that I had chosen and was appropriate for me to get paid at the service level of training language and marketing skill sets that I was delivering. And most people paid the price. In marketing, there was some flexibility to pr pr proposition a company based on how large they were, how much revenue they literally had, and how much could they really afford to share some of their revenue based on what they were hoping to gain from my work with me. And that's kind of a predictive capability that I sort of have. I choose the price that's literally right for them to the best of my ability. And if they say yes, then I've done it well. Now, in other situations, we have men and women who want to get a lot of things for free. The only free thing we have to do is utilize our technology to produce content. The real question is what content is appropriate and what content is not appropriate for the world. You see, it's all dependent on who we're trying to reach, what our target for doing the content is, and openly, will it produce the results that we're longing to get, whether it's safety in this world, whether it's a political action group started, whether it's social justice, or whether we're just trying to marry a girl who hasn't seen our skill sets enough to say, you know what, he's worth talking to again. He's worth possibly dating for a little while, and maybe, just maybe, that one loves me more than life itself and has more than proven it to me over the course of many years that he's patiently waited to have his turn. Now, when I talk about this, I'm not being not being uncandid. I literally did propose to a girl over my uh, social media channel. I'm not sure whether or not she got the tweet or not. And that's a sad thing because it was kind of a unique moment of time to do it like that. I've also sung a video proposal. I can't promise whether or not she saw that. But openly, those are my lawful rights. I can produce any loving video I want to, or I can produce a harangue of reporters' videos of the things that I see as an observer. So not like the late Andy Rooney, who was a wonderful 60 Minutes reporter, I'm pretty sure that's the show he was on, who literally made commentary about the observations that he saw that were quirky, unusual, and different. And he got paid to do it. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But we also have a situation going on in the religious realm of Indiana, where religion is starting to filter into a lot of places. It's filtering into our hospitals, and those hospitals are filtering into our school systems. Those school systems are being impacted by the local churches. <clears throat> Excuse me, and metaphysical groups are sort of losing ground. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. Is that a good thing? Possibly. It all depends on the leaders of those organizations and how much they allow, tolerate, of other people's beliefs of faith. I sort of know something about this because I have friends in the Catholic realm who carry their <coughs> uh, rosary beads with them at all times. I actually carry one with me too. I don't use it very much because I've only been shown once how to use it, but openly it was a gift from a priest in a situation that was sort of difficult, and I like the fact that it's with me. I also know that someone damaged it and took beads off of it because I had those accidental beads in my hands. I also have had a lot of religious artifacts of my life ruined. I recently had a car in impound, and almost every pendulum, if you will, or faith pop that I created was virtually destroyed. Not only were these monsters taking out my marketing materials and literally obliterating them, taking the good cardstock I had purchased to be a flimsy and easy to carry card of information, did they mangle those to the point that they're almost damaged, but they also took them all out of the packages. On top of that, they took apart the faith fogs that I created and reassembled them in appropriate, inappropriate ways where the chains didn't match the metals, the, the uh, handles didn't match the actual uh, medallion, and openly that took a lot of time for me to reset what I had planned based on how spirit guides a person to create a beautiful work of art. We have lots of works of art around in the Hamilton County community. We have bronze statues that someone lovely did by hand and cast in clay and then in iron and all that sort of stuff. We have all sorts of art galleries all around in people's paintings, photography, and everything else. There's an international art fair that comes through the community, and literally there's all sorts of festivals throughout the holiday time as well as through the summer months that give us opportunities to discover and value art. Penrod is a pretty big art fair in Indianapolis, and openly Indianapolis is known for its artists. There are arts councils that help budding artists get off the ground. There are theater groups that take in our scripts. 
and our playwrights, and openly, that's the reality of Indianapolis. Community is a cultural district in the world, and for the most part, our city, thankfully, is pretty safe. There's not a lot of places you want to go alone, it's not true, but in truth, for the most part, we can walk alone carefully throughout the way. Now, there's always somebody who's boring on your life. They don't mean to, they're just observing, they've got nothing else to keep their mind going, they're not messing with their telephone, but it's openly what happens in the world. Now, when we talk about these things, is that anything unusual for anyone listening in this podcast or audio cast channel? Not really. Is it really honorable to talk about someone's life? Maybe. It just depends on how we're sharing the story, why we're sharing the story, or if we're telling a tale just to help us sell something. You see, the positive stories help us sell. The negative stories also help us sell. But openly, sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. In life, we have moments of time to make things right with people. And that's really what Jesus talks about. There's a portion of my book, Soul Keepers, that talks about how I struggled to bring about peace in a relationship that was more important to my soul than any other in life. And I still struggle to get that girl to understand how much I care for her, how much I loved her, and how readily I was to marry her. The problem now is that other people in the administrative world have openly destroyed my little rights. They took away my privacy, they ruined my respect, to privacy of my physicality, and openly, my family members participated. That was a devastating blow to my life to have that such a betrayal, but also it's outlandish in a political marketplace where people think that these people we're supposed to go to for help are actually going to help us when the crap that's going on in our life gets out of control. Theft, burglary, other sorts of violations of personhood, property, and paperwork is federally illegal, yet sometimes local law enforcement turn a blind eye because they don't really care because they feel like the opiate trade or something else is a higher priority. Not really. You see, it's the little things that happen in life, the little chances, the little opportunities that these stealing people take that turn them into the other aspects of illicit and illegal activities. And that's where we begin. I get so tired of these signs in the parking lots that say, lock your cars, take your valuables with me. And I'm like, no, here's what we do. We put the federal law on that sign that says it is federally illegal to get in someone else's car without their permission and without their key, and without their say-so. Anything you steal, you will go to jail for. Now, wouldn't that be a different approach to marketing the concept of theft, saying that it is a dishonor to you, your family, your name, and every other aspect of life in America if you steal from someone else's vehicle? Now, that produces an attitude, but it also produces the truth that in the world people have hard-earned dollars that they produce for themselves to purchase the things they love so that they can share that property in their own way with the people in their lives. Now that's another way to market What, who gives them the right to go into their house and take things? I don't know. I had lovely angelic gifts that I had set aside for this coming holiday season that were totally pilfered from my home. Things in my car and impound have also been stolen completely and I am looking for my car keys now that got taken when I was downtown and left my property in a family's home. She insists that she didn't touch one little thing in my bags, and yet a lot of the questions she asked me are related to what is now in my bags. I had a can of chicken noodle soup in my bag. The next minute I looked up, I found that I had a tomato soup can in the bag. I'm pretty darn sure that I didn't do a a little (coughs) canned uh, eye coordination mishap at the store where I bought the wrong thing. I'm pretty good about making sure I buy the right thing and putting it in my bag. I usually look at the label so I know what's supposed to be there. But openly, someone did steal my federally protected car keys. I put them in a pouch on my father's uh, bequeathed shirt, and they're now not there. And openly, it makes me distrust the sibling or the relative who I might choose to stay with during my challenges in life. There's also people who think they've got some right to make comments about the things that I choose to do in my religious practice and openly, that is not their lawful right. They have no lawful right to voy around my life. They have no lawful right to tell me I can't produce a faith like I have and openly, I would challenge my faith to theirs any second of the day. Give me a map, give them a GPS, and I'm pretty sure I'll get there quicker. Now, what do I mean by a map? I mean simply tell me where we're going or don't tell me where we're going and I'll get there regardless. That's what happens in life when you put your faith in something higher. But openly, I don't have to talk much more about that. My faith hubs are for sale. If you see me any place, you'll know I have them on you. 
I'm happy to share them with me and I, with you, and I'm openly happy to sell them because I've got bills to pay. Bills that are mounting because people legally told me they were going to help me with something, but instead they chose not to pay that little thing that was so modest, and now it's a monstrous bill because of the overdraft charge that banks charge us. It's bad enough that we have an overdraft. It's sort of humiliating. Most of us like to manage our money well, but these banks really steal from us. They charge us one little overdraft almost every single day. Think how fast we become in debt where our credit gets ruined with them just because we had that problem. And the other thing, it takes them almost 10 days to let us know we had a problem if we didn't recognize or realize we were going to have a problem. Most people try to manage their funds really well. Now I'm talking about real things, real life, real situations, real experiences with family and other situations that are sort of out of control. But when I lived happily in the arts and design district of my community, I had never had one problem until the last year when someone just thought they'd manhandle my life. And for the last three years, I've been struggling because of that lie, because of those problems, because other people just thought that my rights didn't matter as much as their right to steal, pilfer, and ruin a man's name. Now, this has been Blake Henson of Blaze Communications, LLC, talking about the mayhem of life that is caused by people. The magic of life is something that I'm happy to talk about in my speaking series coming up called, <coughs> if of all things, the Dragon Priest. Anybody who's known my companies for a long time know that I use dragons as a portion of the marketing. We have two, and my students in my language program know which they are. But openly, there's a red one and there's a blue one, and that's how we market ourselves. They come from the Orient, they have valuable meaning in the spiritual realm of Oriental mythology, and that's all I'm saying on that. Every person who produces a logo for their company has a reason they produce the logo. I literally was in a restaurant this afternoon with a relative who was kind enough to share with me a meal, and openly I had to look at their logo and go, that is an ugly logo, but at the same time, I literally had to look at the logo and go, what the heck character is that? I've never seen that kanji character before. And if I had one of my dictionaries in front of me, I would look it up to find out. And the sad thing is the employees couldn't even tell me what the character was for, what it pertained to, because most of them were not Japanese. And in that interest, the food was good. That's okay. And that's what happens in America, that other nationalities, people, market instead of their own cultural heritage, the Japanese cultural heritage, which I find absolutely fascinating as a story in itself. Now, once again, this has been Blake Enson of Blaze Communications LLC, talking in freeform journalism fashion in audio cast files that are produced through the YouTube channel and other resources like Vimeo that I love very much and I'm grateful for in my life. Thanks for listening.